Even when we were children, the stars intrigued us, excited us, inspired us. We looked into the night sky and we wondered, what's beyond what we see up there? Hi, I'm Marcus Lloyd, and in this series, we will answer some of the questions you may have asked yourself. We'll take a journey together, a journey through the universe. We'll look at ways God's creation is confirmed by science, and we'll see that the heavens described in the Bible are consistent with all we've learned about space. Today we know that there are more stars than grains of sand on this beach, many more. But what else do we know? The stars have a lot to teach us, and they've been sharing their lessons for thousands of years. As humans began to understand the passage of stars across the night sky, they found a connection in the migration of birds and other animals, the food they hunted to survive. They learned when to plant and harvest crops by tracking the movement of the heavens. In time, they even found ways to navigate ships by them. The ancients used the motion of the stars to guide their activities, but they couldn't explain why the stars moved as they did. That part remains a mystery. What could explain it all? The answer has been right here for millennia in our one infallible guide, the Bible. Uh, some people claim that uh, the terminology in the Bible supports a flat earth. There are terms like sunrise and sunset, or in Joshua's time when the sun stood still. Revelation 7 verse 1 refers to angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Okay, well, okay, right. the, the terms sunrise and sunset are still used today. Yes. And, and everyone knows that when someone uses these terms, it doesn't uh, mean that they believe that the earth is flat and the sun moves in an arch throughout the sky. Yeah. Today we use the same language conventions that the Bible used here. It's the language of, of appearance or phenomenological language. Right. And from our perspective, Perspective on the surface of the earth, the sun certainly does appear to rise up from the horizon yeah. high into the sky and then it sets in the western sky. It's, it's the same thing at the time of Joshua. The miracle at his time that caused the sun to stop moving through the sky, again employing phenomenological language, the language of appearance, obviously the miracle was that God stopped the earth's motion and held everything in place. That's right. the miracle. When Revelation talks about the four corners of the earth, again, we still use that kind of terminology today sure. in the figurative sense. It's the commonly used um, way to refer to the cardinal directions, right? North, south, east, and west. Right. As the Christian worldview reached across Europe, it brought new ways of looking at things. No longer were the heavens the dark and frightening place of our superstitious past. Now we saw order and design everywhere, God's design. Stars moved in a set pattern that allowed ancient mariners to navigate ships similar to this. It was a universe that the human mind could explore and understand. Scientific knowledge went through a period of explosive growth. The invention of the telescope extended the range of celestial exploration far beyond what anyone had anticipated. By the mid-1600s, we knew the basic structure of the solar system. But for the first time, we understood that moons orbit planets and planets orbit the sun in elliptical paths. But we still didn't know why. Scientists of the day couldn't grasp the reason. What force could cause the planets to move as they do? It would take some creative biblical thinking to answer that question. Today, we're gonna to look at one of the most brilliant men in history, Sir Isaac Newton. His work broke barriers and broadened our horizons. It was a turning point in the history of mankind and it marked the birth of modern science. Newton's discoveries would eventually allow humanity to build craft that would actually travel into space. Now, if you just tuned in, this week we're talking about the flat earth myth and the Bible. There's ample historical evidence that Christians going way back to early medieval times understood that the earth was round. Right. Now, moving forward to the time of Columbus, who uh, lived from 1451 to 1506, we find that he was never opposed by flat earthers. This was simply because there, there were none to oppose him amongst <laughs> either the church or political leaders. So what exactly was the real issue? Well, the real issue was Columbus was trying to reach India by sea, the long way around the earth. But to do that, his ships had to carry enough provisions for the, the, the entire length of the journey, obviously. He had learned from the 9th century Persian astronomer Alfraganus, he'd estimated each degree of latitude spanned 56 and two-thirds miles. Mm -hmm. But Columbus thought that, uh, that Alfraganus uh, meant the Roman mile, which is 1,480 meters, but he was using the 
Arabic mile, which is 1,830 meters. Oops. Thus, Columbus thought that the Earth's circumference was only about three quarters of its actual length of about 40,000 kilometers. Yeah, Columbus also greatly underestimated the distance between Japan and the Canary Islands as 3,000 Italian miles, about 3,700 kilometers. Uh, but the actual distance by sea is more is, is over 19,000 <laughs> kilometers. So he was way, way off there. Right. So it was the, the size of the Earth, not the shape that was under dispute. Right. His critics argued that the ships of his day in 1492 could not carry enough fresh water and food for such a huge journey. And they were right. <laughs> Columbus was just lucky that uh, an enormous continent was in the way <laughs> as he was going there. <laughs> Maybe people think the debate in his day was about... The, the shape of the earth because that's what Bugs Bunny taught us. Pasta fazool. She's around, she's a firm, she's a full intact. She's around the back of my head. She's flat like your head. <laughs> she's flat like your head, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Columbus didn't know about the Viking discoveries centuries earlier, and he still thought he'd landed in the East Indies. Uh, that, that was the name at the time for the Indian subcontinent. Right. The result of this mistake continues to the present day, and the common name for Native North Americans is Indians. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the much parroted flat earth myth obviously doesn't come from Bugs Bunny or from history. So the question is, where did the myth that the church mm. taught that the earth was flat actually come from? It came from a book called The Life and Voyages of Christopher Columbus, published in 1828, authored by Washington Irving. Irving was probably America's first genuine best-selling writer. Mm. Uh, he admitted that he was, quote, apt to indulge the imagination. And flat earth belief was one of those, fr uh, those figments of his imagination. Yeah, you know, it was bad enough that this myth entered the public perception thanks to the popularity of Irving's book, but it became worse when it acquired a veneer of scholarship so it could be used as a club with which to bash Christianity. Right. The main propagandists for the cause uh, were the notorious 19th century anti-Christian bigots, John William Draper and Andrew Dixon White. Right, Draper was, was a fine chemist and photographer and the first president of the American Chemical Society, but he was a lousy historian. Uh, he wrote the book, History of the Conflict Between Religion and Science in 1874. It was a, a really poorly research, researched polemic against the church. Right, uh, White was a disgruntled ex-Episcopalian uh, and the founder of Cornell University as the first explicitly secular university in the United States. He also published the two volume work, History of the Warfare of Science with Theology in Christendom in 1896. Now, both authors relied heavily on the work of Cosmas the Monk, who lived in the 6th century. They, were, they, they, they portrayed his flat earth teaching as typical, rather than the almost forgotten extreme minority view that it actually was. Actually, they're the ones most responsible for, for the discredited conflict thesis between Christianity and science. The reality is that the Christian worldview was responsible for science in the first place, while it was still born in other places like ancient Greece and, and in China. The Bible tells us that God upholds the universe by His power in an orderly and consistent way. That's what makes science possible. It's no surprise that some of the most significant advances in science were made by men of faith. Consider astronomy. The whole field rests on discoveries made by devout Christians like Johannes Kepler. We've seen how the biblical thinking of Galileo and Isaac Newton moved astronomy forward. It was people of faith who showed us that the universe obeys the same God-given laws the Earth does. It's that mathematical consistency that makes space travel possible. By studying how things move on Earth, it allows us to figure out how things will move in space because God controls them both. It lets us go deeper and deeper into space, making remarkable new discoveries. Our voyage into the universe has revealed many secrets so far, but there will always be more to learn. In this episode, the journey is going to take us all the way to the edge of our solar system. Even though, although hardly anyone in the church had ever taught that the earth was flat, do people outside the church believe the earth is flat? Natalie Wolchover, reporting in Live Science in June 2011, writes, Incredibly, some people still do. <laughs> yeah. In her report, she <laughs> said, The Flat Earth Society is an active organization currently led by a Virginian man named Daniel Shenton. Though Shenton believes in evolution and global warming, he and his hundreds, if not thousands of followers worldwide, also believe that the Earth is a disk that you can fall off of. 
<laughs> so well, the next time an evolutionist calls you a flat earther, point out that the leading flat earther <laughs> is one of their fellow evolutionists. That's right. Regarding the, the photographic proof, which is probably the best proof there is, they say that NASA is covering <laughs> up the truth about a flat earth and promoting a spherical earth via doctoring images and video to make the earth look spherical through, through CGI, computer generated imagery, that type of thing. Yeah, except um, CGI wasn't invented till just a little while ago. So what about all the other photos and things like well, that? And, and I mean, just, the, the thing is, why? Why? Why would NASA do that? What's the benefit of, of tricking people into believing that the Earth's a sphere instead of being a flat circular disk. What's the payoff? What's the reason you would go through that much trouble and then and, and have these secret hidden cult shadow yeah. people that, that just, no, 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 let them think the Earth's a sphere. Why? Why? <laughs> what's, yeah. the, what's the goal of that? As we're recording this today, Jeff Williams, an astronaut, is aboard the ISS for a six month mission. Scott Kelly holds the current American record for cumulative days in orbit, 534 days. Amazing. Jeff Williams will tie that record on September 6, 2016. Jeff Williams is a Christian. Yeah. I heard him speak at a, at a conference at a church in California a few years ago. So he would need to be in, as a Christian, he would need to be in on this NASA conspiracy too. He's got a camera. You can, you can, he's taking pictures and you can see them on Facebook, right. on, on the NASA site of the cameras that he took like an hour ago, the, the pictures that he took like an hour ago. So he's... He's in on it too. And so were yeah. the Greeks. There's something in the human nature, and I would say it's because we bear the image of God, that seeks to understand the things around us, that uh, wants to search out available resources or potential uh, use of the things around us, to look what's around the corner, to see over the horizon, to want to know what's across this big body of water. Proverbs 25.2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. We've seen how the spread of Christianity led to an explosion of scientific discovery. Educated people no longer thought of the night sky as the realm of pagan gods. Christians see the universe as a creation of the living God, which means it's subject to the same laws of physics and chemistry that apply on Earth, like uh, gravity. Isaac Newton showed us how the same forces that cause an apple to fall to the ground also hold the moon in orbit around the Earth and the planets around the sun. In this episode, we'll see how the science of astronomy has changed in the modern age. The last century has been a time of unprecedented technological growth, and we have gained remarkable insights into the universe. But what about God? Have our more recent discoveries confirmed or contradicted the Bible? Well, let's find out. Let's see where this journey takes us next. I mean, almost all the Earth, uh, early and, and medieval church scholars who commented on the Earth's shape explicitly said that it was round. Okay, medieval European rulers used a golden sphere or orb called the Globus Cruciger to represent the Earth under Christ's rule, again, again emphasizing that they understood that the Earth, the earth was a sphere. Right. Columbus's opponents never disputed the shape of the Earth, but only its size. And they were right. The Earth is much bigger than what Columbus thought. Yeah. The Flat Earth myth began with a fictional account of Columbus in the 19th century by Washington Irving. Uh, then it was aggressively pushed in what ended up being in, an influential anti-Christian polemics by Draper and White. And, of course, there are many evidences for a spherical Earth. And the final irony is, the leading flat earther today is an evolutionist. <laughs> so there you have it. There um, you go.